This is part two of the video series on Uniform Civil Code. My attempt here is to outline a dispassionate, objective uh, perspective on this emerging issue uh, from the point of view of Christian spirituality. Uh, in the second unit, my focus is mainly on the significance of preserving distinctive religious identities, <coughs> the identities, identities of distinct spiritual cultures, in the interest of preserving the health and vitality of a democracy. Um, as a starting point of our discussion, we need to state why the Indian Constitution, which declares itself to be the Constitution for a secular democratic republic, why a constitution like this or why this model of democracy is committed to religious plurality. Uh, most people do not realize, including members of the religious community, they don't realize that the constitutional commitment to preserving the distinct spiritual cultures of various religions has a very important national purpose behind it. Uh, the assumption that that's prevalent throughout the country, the assumption that is entertained by religious minorities as well, is that um, the special rights conferred on religious minorities is a sort of concession to them. Uh, that is a privilege that they have, they, have a, they have a claim on and therefore uh, they can exercise these rights without a sense of uh, responsibility and accountability towards the country as a whole. Now, what is the democratic purpose in securing for and guaranteeing for religious minorities that space they need to preserve their religious cultural identity? Um, see, the point I want to emphasize here is that the preservation of the distinct spiritual cultures of religious minorities is a fundamental need of Indian democracy. Therefore, minority rights are actually an investment made primarily in preserving the health and dynamism of Indian democracy rather than indulging the minorities, because the BJP propaganda in the last uh, 40, 50 years has had a tremendous impact on shaping the outlook of most Indians. And therefore, if you ask people at random, they will tell you that minority rights cannot be defended because these are some special considerations, special privileges conferred on minorities, and therefore they are discriminative uh, towards the, uh, the majority community. Because why should members of religious minorities and uh, uh, religious minority communities have a right which is denied to members of the Hindu community? It's because this context is not understood. That's why I thought it would be desirable, indeed necessary, to make uh, a statement on this and to clarify the context. Now, why do I say that the preservation of religious plurality uh, through the preservation, the protection of the space required for religious minorities to practice their religious or spiritual culture. Why do I say this? It's because if this commitment to pluralism is removed from democracy, democracy will degenerate into fascism in no time. In fact, if you look at fascist societies, fascist body politic, fascist nations, they were all committed to this one nation, one culture, one language, one religion kind of thing. And Hitler's Germany is a good example of it. The moment you accept, the moment you institutionalize the idea of uniformity, you activate anger and intolerance towards minorities for the simple reason that they are the hindrance to this uniformity. So what, is, what was once considered to be an essential feature of Indian democracy and what is vital to the health and dynamics of Indian democracy 
overnight begins to be seen as a major problem. The problem being that the, the continuation of the distinctive cultural identities of religious minorities serves as a hindrance to the unity, the cohesion, and therefore the dynamism of India as a nation. So we must, we must clearly understand this issue, that the moment a democratic culture in a pluralistic nation, pluralistic society, relinquishes or abandons its commitment to plurality, religious plurality, linguistic plurality, plurality of every kind, it shifts its foundation from democracy to fascism. So this is the gravity of the issue that we are considering. So our concern here, and this is what Christians must understand, Christians should not look at BJP's attempt to foist the Uniform Civil Code on India in pursuance of its agenda to uh, slap uniformity, not unity, uniformity on India, not primarily as an attack on their distinct religious or spiritual culture and identity. They should rather look at it, and that is the truth, they should rather respond to it as a serious threat to the preservation and continuation of the democratic culture and democratic way of life in India. So, uh, if you remember that in 2012, four judges of the Supreme Court of India came out in the open, and that was the first time it was happening in the history of post-independent India. Four senior most judges of the Supreme Court of India came out in the open and addressed a press conference. And the note of warning they struck in that press conference was, democracy is in peril in India. I repeat, democracy is in peril in India. And that is the issue which should concern us first and foremost. And it will be a great pity if Christians are concerned only about what is happening to them, what's being done to them. And same with Muslims. It's because of the of, of very childish, uninformed responses to national issues that a community, an entire community, fails to see the larger ramifications of an issue that's being introduced, of course, with uh, ulterior intentions. So, <clears throat> a, a significant feature of the debate that you will see from now onwards will be the attitude to diversity. <clears throat> um, BJP is based on an ideology, the Sangh Parivar ideology, which has declared its commitment to eradicate diversity and to forge uniformity, one nation, one culture, one religion, one language, etc. Uh, and therefore, from the very beginning, the RSS had serious reservations about the Indian constitution. Now, from a dispassionate philosophical cultural point of view, diversity is a source of richness. It is not a liability. But through the power of propaganda, it's possible to get an entire nation or a majority of the people in a nation to believe that diversity is a hindrance, it's a nuisance, and it's a single foremost a stumbling block on the path of India to progress and national strength. Um, and in this context, of course, we must have, we must be clear about the distinction between uniformity and unity. Now, look at the title. It is Uniform Civil Code. So, the value that is, the idea that is prop, uh, presented or posited in this is uniformity. Uh, whereas, the strength of a nation does not lie in uniformity, but in unity. What a nation needs is unity, not uniformity. Now, the interesting thing about unity is that unity, and this is important to understand and remember, unity presupposes diversity. Unity presupposes plurality. Suppose you are alone on an island. 
where there is none other than, other than you. There is no point in talking about uniformity or unity. Unity becomes an issue when there are people different from you and therefore that difference without eliminating those differences we need to create a framework of harmony and that's called unity. Whereas uniformity is the attempt to eliminate the differences and to reinvent everyone after one's own image. So, intolerance to diversity is inherent in the agenda pursuing uniformity, whereas tolerance towards diversity is the hallmark of the agenda of unity. So, in the end what happens is, and this is history, what history teaches us, every time uniformity, which is against law of nature, law of life, every time uniformity is thrust upon a people, foisted on a people, it has destroyed their unity. The moment uniformity is imposed on people, various social, cultural, religious fissures open up suddenly. These conflicts, these fissures remain papered up or papered down or what? Uh, adornment, inactive, but because this attempt to foist uniformity on people is unnatural against the law of life, law of nature, it cannot but evoke a reaction. And the reaction would be invariably towards asserting one's in, uh, distinct identity with unprecedented vehemence, as a result of which there will be an aggravation of tension and thus undermines the unity of a people. So, the, the irony is that through the very pursuit of uniformity, the unity of a society will be completely disrupted, destroyed. So, as I said, uniformity is anti-life, it is anti nature Look at nature, for example. I mean, nature is beautiful because it is diverse. Your garden is beautiful because it's a picture of diversity. Think of a garden with only one type of plant. To the left, to the right, it's only just one type of plant. It's not a flower, it's not a garden. You feel thoroughly bored with it. Or think of being in a, uh, 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 in a company of, say, 25 people, each one of them a carbon copy of the other. Each one talks exactly the same way, talks the same thing, expresses the same sentiment, pursues the same goal. This, the boredom that this generates will drive you mad. So, all these things are completely overlooked and suddenly uniformity is presented as the ultimate goal of life which is poisonous to life. And I'm surprised that this is not understood and it's not talked about. And it's high time that we foreground to such issues. So, let's be very clear, let's restate it, let's underline it, let's affirm it. The pursuit of uniformity will destroy unity. Uniformity is anti-life, it's unnatural. Uh, the whole of creation is distinguished for its diversity, plurality, etc. But there is another issue which I need to uh, underline, even more than what I have said so far, and this is of great value, of uh, particular relevance to human beings. Now, all of us cherish our individuality. It's not a compliment to say, oh, you know, that fellow is a carbon copy of the other fellow. Uh, what is, what is um, uh, valuable is uh, the recognition that he or she is unique, as a distinctive, well-defined identity, which means that he or she is different from others, right? Now, what is important to realize is this. If there is a commitment to individuality in relation to humanity, that is, if we attach any value to human individuality at all, then we must respect plurality. Now, we are not particularly concerned about plurality as far as an animal species is concerned. You keep, say, uh, 500 buffaloes together. Uh, you know, you are not particularly concerned about the uniqueness of each buffalo. But if you have 500 people, each one of them is distinct and that's the beauty of being human. So, the moment you exalt uniformity as the ultimate value, a value greater than unity, what happens is you completely destroy the space for human individuality 
and by doing so you degrade human beings to the level of beasts, of animals. It's a very serious issue and I hope my fellow countrymen, the, my fellow citizens of India, irrespective of their religious labels, would rec recognize the gravity of the issue that I have just now identified. So, <clears throat> um, consider for example, the value that we attach to thinking. Now, the thinking of each person will be unique. On the other hand, if you have a regimented society, a society of uniformity in intellectual matters, every person will think alike. So, if you have uh, 140 crore Indians, it will be 140 carbon copies of one Indian. Now, how terribly disappointing that state would be, uh, you can imagine. So, uniformity in thinking will make us mere consumers of opinion. And that's the culture that's already established in our midst. You know, this idea of public opinion. Public opinion is a misnomer because this is not the opinion produced by the public. It is public opinion only to the extent that a handful of people produce these opinions, but these opinions are then thrust upon, foisted upon the public, which also means that the public is denied the right to think for themselves. So, in order for propaganda to work, in order to degrade the people to the level of being mere consumers of public opinion, it is necessary that they are all destroyed in terms of their individuality and recast in the mode of uniformity, uniform thinking, uniform responses, uniform endorsement. Now, this is good news for the dictator because if a people lack individuality and all of them accept the uniform mold, it's very easy to control them. That's why dictators throughout human history have preferred uniformity to unity and they have all been allergic to the beauty of human individuality. So, the agenda to promote uniformity, this is a very serious issue, will also generate a culture that is intolerant of intellectual life. As I said, thinking is the main source, thinking is a secret, thinking is a seed of human individuality. And if individuality is a value and if it is allowed free play, there will be diversity, there will be plurality and therefore the agenda of uniformity cannot work. Now think the other way. If the agenda of uniformity is to work, you have to suppress thinking. And by suppressing thinking, you foist intellectual regimentation, intellectual uniformity on people. And it will destroy a people because, after all, when it comes to science and technology, we always talk about innovation. What is innovation? Innovation is not repeating the same thing that happened all the time. Renovation is going on to explore unexplored territories, creating that which does not exist, creating that which is unprecedented, that which is unique. So, innovation is in the realm of science and technology, what commitment to individuality is in the domain of religion and culture. So, how can you have allergy to individuality in the domain of religion and culture and at the same time exalt innovation as a value in the domain of science and technology? This is something that people need to talk about. You cannot play it both ways. Either you want regimentation, uniformity, homogenization, etc. And face the consequence for it. The consequence is that you will become an intellectually mediocre uh, society, will be incapable of innovation, discovery, will be incapable of progress, and the whole nation will be degraded to the level of animals, incapacity to think, etc. And the cost of this will be too serious, but by the time the common man realizes this, it will be too late. That's the reason why some of us need to sp talk about it right now. So, uh, in contrast to uniformity, what is desirable is unity. And I said, as I already said, unity presupposes diversity. So, universe, sorry, unity in consciousness 
individual consciousness, national consciousness involves a harmony of thoughts. Unity of consciousness does not imply absence of thought. Absence of thought will uh, breed uniformity and consolidate uniformity. Absence of thought will not create unity because unity is the product of the harmony of thought. Unity in national consciousness can result only from the harmony of thoughts. That's why in our Indian tradition we have always said that there be a thousand windows open to all possibilities because ultimately the genius of India was not the genius of homogenization or uniformity. It was the, homoge it was the genius of assimilation. That is to say the genius in, of India had this remarkable power to accept a diversity of influences and possibilities and to synthesize all this and to create something unique of its own. That's a tremendous strength. And this present agenda to, to, to trust uniformity on the people will be highly destructive of the genius of India. Mark my words, a time will come and what I say today will become uh, far more meaningful than they seem today. So, uh, let's underline this important insight that diversity or plurality is a precondition for unity. If it is the unity of India that is being sought, then the people who are sponsoring this movement should talk about unif unity, not, not uniformity. And they should be firmly committed to preserving, in fact, accentuating religious, cultural, linguistic diversities. Because unity in the final analysis is a harmonious synthesis of diverse strands of thought. And that's the reason why unity of this kind is infinitely productive of human good. Because unif uniformity will destroy everything and make a whole nation, an entire society to shrivel and no, no good will come out of it. So, uh, in a country, in a society uh, where there, are, there is no diversity, uh, there is no need to talk about uh, 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 unity. Uh, unity becomes an agenda, unity becomes an imperative because unity is the necessary matrix, necessary cl uh, climate of opinion, necessary framework within which the diversity, the wealth of diversity becomes a blessing. Now suppose the framework of unity does not exist, then diversity could become a liability. So the terrible misunderstanding underlying the present uh, uh, debate about uh, the need to tame religious uh, uh, diversity, religious plurality, is that um, um, uh, diversity seems a liability only when the framework of unity is missing. If the framework of unity exists, then the wealth represented by religious, linguistic, cultural minor, uh, diversities can be synthesized into something very profound and powerful. Whereas, if that framework or that culture or that spirituality of unity is absent, then what the sponsors of the uniformity agenda say today is right. Religious diversity, plurality can become a hindrance. And here, religious minorities have to play a very healthy and proactive role. And one of the things I want to emphasize and emphasize with all the force at my command is, that it's high time the religious communities, particularly Muslims and Christians in this country, re-examined their stances, re-examined their grandstanding. If they think that they can carve out a separate space for themselves, can live as a law unto themselves without any sensitivity and accountability to the larger whole, they got it terribly, terribly mistaken. It's this attitude that activates the Sang Parivar agenda of imposing uniformity because the religious minorities like Christians and Muslims have first rejected unity. We rejected, we never accepted the discipline of unity because how can you accept, or how can you claim that you accept the responsibility or discipline of unity when you live unto your, as a law unto yourself in a, your own enclave, in your own uh, petty uh, cocoon without any sense of accountability to the nation, pursuing your own parochial agenda, 
sometimes to the detriment of national interests. That attitude is even more reprehensible, I would say, than the Sangh Parivar agenda to foist uniformity on all religious communities in the interest of standardization under the pretext of, under the, under the, uh, uh, invoking the excuse of abolishing discrimination on the basis of religion. This will be the acceptable, non-controversial facade for an agenda that's essentially deleterious, anti-democratic, anti-human individuality, anti-life, anti-nature. That's been the burden of my argument so far. On that I close. I proceed to the next level of our argument in the next video. I thank you once again for continuing this journey of understanding the various facets of the national debate on the desirability or otherwise of evolving and imposing a uniform civil code on all citizens of India. Thank you.